saw the dawn of time in the last millennium at Her Majesty's Theatre in London, comic history was made. Monty Python teamed up with Beyond the Fringe in aid of Amnesty International. The success of these shows has lasted for nearly three decades. They also led on to Live Aid and Comic Relief. The Amnesty shows were such a landmark that those of us who took part can't remember much about them. Good evening, madam, and your name is? Mrs. Yeti Goose Creature. I'm sorry, I can remember so little about it. <laughs> it's very embarrassing. Plenty of people remember you. We all want to see Basil Brush back on television. <laughs> Because I can't remember you anything can't about it. I must really shall now to bed to sleep off all the nonsense I've just said. And the odd thing is I can't remember any of these events at all. And then I want to end it, if I may, Norwich. Norwich, yes. Well, it's an idiomatic way of saying, Nick is off ready when I come home. <laughs> I'd totally forgotten the words, though I must have said it 1,200 times. I'd basically forgotten being involved in it at all. <laughs> I can't remember what happened, I see. Never! Leave Orifice alone! <laughs> if I could just remember one thing. You don't even know me, oh. do you, Saunders? You don't even realise that... <laughs> But I remember being shite. I remember thinking, you know, we should have rehearsed this. I forget I was on drums. The series of shows known as The Secret Policeman's Ball was a turning point in British comedy and music. The roll call was a rich mix of styles and talents brought together for the first time. The first benefit show was the brainchild of John Cleese, a godfather of British comedy. His reputation persuaded performers to give their services for free. They wanted to raise money and awareness for Amnesty International, which was then a little-known human rights charity fighting to end torture and free prisoners of conscience. It began when um, Amnesty had very little money at all. And one day I noticed a cheque go by, son Jay Cleese. And I knew somebody who vaguely knew him, so I phoned her up and begged the telephone number, which she gave me. And one day I phoned John, it was lunchtime. I kind of remember it because there was a crunching sound at the other end of the phone because John was eating a lettuce sandwich. And he said, how can we raise money for Amnesty? Well, it seemed like the most obvious thing in the world. I said, let's do a stage show because that's the one thing I guess that I knew how to organize. And he said, well, if I'm going to do this, we've got to give it for two or three nights. There's no point in doing it just for one night. You find the theater, I'll give you the telephone numbers of the people. And if you can get them, we'll go ahead. And except for a couple of them who were away or couldn't manage it, they all said yes. We wanted it to be something that people could go along to in the evening. And it was 10 o'clock, don't forget, when the show started. Actually, John, it was nearer midnight. Because there'd been another show in the theatre that had just finished a proper professional show that night in a West End theatre, and then we would go along and entertain them, hopefully, for two hours. Ah, uh, even I remember the words of this one. Oh, God. It parrot sketch. Oh, dear me. I wish to register a complaint. <laughs> the content of the Amnesty show was, was very simple. It was stuff that people knew well, would not have to spend a lot of time rehearsing, 
and which was um, tried and trusted. We knew it was going to work. Remarkable bird, the Norwegian blue, in it, eh? Beautiful plumage. <laughs> the plumage don't enter into it. He's stone dead. No, no, he's resting. All right, then, if he's resting, I'll wake him up. Hello, Mr. Polly Potter. <laughs> I've got a nice fresh cuttlefish for you if you wake up. Is that him? No, he didn't. That was you. <laughs> oh, no, no. This is only 1976, and yet the sketch is already a cliche of comedy, and John and Mike know it backwards, and of course the audience knows it backwards as well. I mean, John and Mike could be just miming, and the audience could have said the words. And this is one of the very best stage performances I think we ever did. I mean, I've never seen John at such so high voltage. It was absolutely terrific. It does a great routine with it. There should be sort of an Olympic sport of parrot bashing. And he would win hands down. Look at that. Bong, 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 bong. Bang, bang, swap, bang, dong, bong. Where's he get it from? Incredible. I've never seen him do that before. And we did that show many times on stage after that. I don't think it ever worked quite as well. Now that's what I call a dead parrot. <laughs> He's stunned. The audience is already laughing because they know what's coming. And sometimes you can see it throws their timing. And because the timing's different, and their, their performance becomes different, and you see Mike breaking up, he often starts laughing. He's probably pining for the field. Some of the sketches became national treasures. Do you remember when Margaret Thatcher used part of this sketch at a Tory conference? I think it was about the Lib Dem party, and they persuaded her to do it. And of course, she was good at many things, but she was not very good. <laughs> they coached her. This is an ex parrot. <laughs> It is not merely stunned, it has ceased to be, expired, and gone to meet its maker. <laughs> but she actually used quite a lot of it, and uh, the Pythons were all convinced that we should take it to court and sue her for breach of copyright. <clears throat> when Peter says, Oh, saucy Worcester, dost thou lie so low? Jonathan Miller directed the first show. He was a member of the theatrical review Beyond the Fringe, along with Peter Cook, Dudley Moore and top playwright Alan Bennett. Beyond the Fringe captured the mood of Britain in the 60s. Their huge success in the West End and on Broadway launched the satire movement. But the trouble with being a minor is as soon as you're too old and tired and ill and sick and stupid, to do your job properly, you have to go. Or well, the very opposite advice with the judges. The things they were saying about the country and the pot shots they were taking at the government people were things that no one had ever done before. And we were brought up believing that archbishops and generals and members of parliament and lords and ladies were there because they were somehow sort of, you know, they, 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 they deserved that place and they, they had wisdom and all that. And then you, you realise a gradual process, a fairly quick process of disenchantment was setting in in the 60s and our leaders were out of touch and they were, you know, they, they were certainly out of touch with how sort of younger people were thinking about the world. And, um, and Beyond the Fringe articulated that so well. Accurate observation of social styles and class styles uh, was characteristic of Beyond the Fringe. That was what amused the audiences that came. Because we were not traditional showbiz characters, but were university performers, there was a higher level of sort of comic literacy. Tell me, are you using yes here in the affirmative sense? <laughs> No. Who am I? He would 
cried despairingly. While Lawrence of Arabia passes by with stopping and saying, <laughs> May I claim my five pounds? They're very rigorous, the judges in exams. They're noted for their rigour. People come staggering out, saying, Oh, my God, what a rigorous exam. <laughs> The audience didn't know how scary it was for all concerned. Stand quickie. This was the first time Beyond the Fringe was on stage with Monty Python, a coup for amnesty. Those comedians were giants in their own right, but their styles were very different. No one knew if it would end in laughter or tears. I think even for the Pythons, we were the old men of comedy. They were seniors, you know, like a school, sort of school set-up. They were school prefects and we were third form ticks. They just were much smarter than we were. We were, we, we fell on, you know, being silly. And they weren't silly. Uh, and to be sort of in the same rooms as these guys was, was, you know, was really exciting. You don't seem competitive in the way that we were. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I couldn't work with Jonathan again. We just didn't, wouldn't get on, really. I mean, you know, it, uh... Some of the comics had never even met, let alone performed in each other's sketches. I don't think we ever got laughs on <laughs> Dudley Moore was in Hollywood, so Terry Jones took his role in the classic Beyond the Fringe parody of Shakespeare. It, it, actually, the funny thing is that it doesn't matter how it goes because it, it, it sort of plays itself because it's so ludicrous, you know. I do remember there are great barren patches in this. Oh, no, there are. the bits I'm involved in. <laughs> but, uh, uh, One of the things that surprised Alan and myself was the, what seemed to us to be the unaccountable admiration that the Python people had for the Fringe, as if we were somehow pioneers of something which they then carried on, which they, you know, to be honest about it, carried on with much greater success. I mean, beyond the Fringe, they were sort of gods to us. I mean, they, they, were, they were gods when we were at the university, so um, I was always felt a bit intimidated by uh, Peter and uh, Jonathan Miller and um, Alan Bennett. And in fact, when I had to play Dudley Moore's part, it was a bit nerve-wracking. Alan comes on and sits on a seat in the centre, and you put yourself sweetly and coyly at his, at his feet. Yes, I was on the... the uh, yeah, I don't know. He plucked so hard. Yeah, but, but they were all totally discordant. Yes, I don't... That's, yes, that's, that's right, yeah. didn't you? That's like... Ooh! <laughs> so like a, I think it was even just one string rather than... You yes, know, just right. one string, just one string. And then I think what you do is make it as accurately, sweetly, mm. sort of uh, Dellerish as you can, uh, rather than putting a sort of... Uh, any sort of comment on it, so that yeah, it's as near it. as possible to it. So. Oh, death, his face, my shroud hath hid. At least he drowned my poor grief. Only it was free to Pluto's realm. And in his arms I shall grow. Wise words in mouths of fools do of themselves belie. Beyond the Fringe was watched and applauded and approved almost entirely by middle-aged, middle-class people, not by young people. Young people didn't come in large numbers. Young people became absolutely passionate about Monty Python. <laughs> Their uh, fame and their reclame and just their general, the fact that they had fans in a way that we had never had fans like that. Uh, that was the first time I'd seen that, really. And, and to see a theatre full of them was, uh, was extraordinary. Dudley Moore's absence led to another unique pairing. Sing! Sing! John Cleese got to perform with Peter Cook. Everyone of my generation thought that Peter was the great genius. In fact, when he went on to perform at these shows, you could hardly find space in the wings because you were being crowded out. And I'd heard about this sketch, and it was marvellous to actually go on stage with one of your heroes and do it with him. I said, did you know that you've got four miles of tubing in your stomach? No, no, I didn't know that, no. It's a good thing I'm here then, isn't it? <laughs> Aren't you interested in your intestines? Not particularly. Well, you should be. You should be. Because without your intestines, you'd be unable to digest. Then you'd look a bit of a fool, wouldn't you? <laughs> Would 
you like to see a diagram of your intestines? <laughs> Got a diagram of your intestines here. Well, it's not actually your intestines. <laughs> Peter would never stick to the script, remember that. He always just throw it in and make it up in the end. He'd say, Peter, are you going to do this line about so and so? And you'd say, oh, uh, yeah, it was the line, oh, yes, yes, very probably. And there was no help if you had the line after that. You just had to wait for it to finish. Did you know that the whale is not really a fish? It's an insect. <laughs> the great advantage, of course, of doing sketches with Peter is that he's going to come in and drive you mad, but you're going to have a newspaper with all the lines in it, you see. So there was, I have the entire script in here. See how far it has to go, the food? Four miles at one mile an hour. <laughs> this means none of the food that reaches your stomach is ever really fresh. <laughs> Shall I tell you something? You're one of the most boring, tedious, uninteresting, monotonous, flatulent, flat-headed, cloth-eared, swivel-eyed, fornicating little gits I ever laid out. Is that a fact? <laughs> well, very interesting. was based on this servant at my school called Arthur Boylett, who used to come around and tell you this incredibly boring, which she thought interesting facts. But he, he had a line, he said, um, I uh, sold, uh, you know, that stone which used to lie just outside the um, left-hand side of the gravel driveway as you go out on the left-hand side. And I sold that yesterday because I thought I saw it move. And he kept selling things which he thought he saw move. If anything moved, it became valuable. The Oxbridge styles of both the Fringe and the Pythons differed sharply from the new wave of stand-up comedians. But these two guys were in Rome. Billy Connolly was a hot young comic from Scotland, bringing with him a special brand of Glaswegian humour. The sun was belting down on them, you know, belt. And, uh, hey, the sun's built and doing in me. Oh, I'm only got a bevy out, right? The shot. <laughs> so they shot into a wee bar in Rome. And they right up to the bar and said, uh, Jimmy, give us two pints of heavy. You know? <laughs> he says, What? In Italian, like, you know, in a. Two pints of heavy, you deep for something. He said, look, we, we, we don't have heavy in Rome, he says. We've got all sorts of clever things, but we don't have heavy. But look, you're welcome to anything you see here. And I, I don't know about any of these things and that. No. I... Hey, tell you what, what does the Pope drink? The guy says, oh, creme de mince. I've heard he likes a wee glass of creme de mince now and again. Give us two pints of that, well! The one thing I did discover during the shows was that the stand-ups had a tremendous advantage. If you put a sketch after a stand-up, the energy dropped. Because if you stand there on your own in a spotlight with a microphone, you know, there's such a focus of energy and the microphone gives you such power that it was very, very hard to follow the best stand-up performers. It was very hard to follow um, Humphreys, for example. I knew Barry a little bit. You know, you bump into people here and there. And Barry, I think, was doing a show in town. And I said to him, when, what time do you finish your show? Could you possibly come along and do a bit? And he did. I'll finish here, and I'll stay yeah. in Edna's clothes. Yeah. I think I'll stay in that. Yeah, fine. Now, I'm not going to walk down the Haymarket wearing it. No. I'll organise a car... Yes. ..that will take me yes. and Iris, my accomplice... Yeah. ..down to the theatre. Mm -hmm. By the way, I forgot to tell you something, Iris. Uh. I agreed a long time ago to do a charity appearance on Thursday, Friday and Saturday nights after the show. Thursday the show? 
and I haven't told you yet. Why, does it affect me? Yes. Uh, I feel that it would be nice. To, I can't do it alone, Iris. Well, I did hear, but I didn't know whether it affected me. I thought you might be doing a sketch. But I just, would you mind being there just in case I lose my voice and you have to go on? Oh, that will be lovely. <laughs> They'll adore that. All right. Well, thanks, Iris. I'm, I'm sorry that you have to be told this on camera, as it were. Bless your heart. <laughs> The English have a quality I'd like to sing about. It's not the sort of quality bestowed on wild or crowd. When things are on the sticky side, you never throw a tear. A special something sees you through. I'll tell you what it is. Spunk, spunk, spunk. You're so full of there are companies that are rumbling and our members sadly shrunk. <laughs> so, don't spoil yourselves, don't be unnecessary. Remember you're out. This is a kind of early incarnation of uh, Barry Humphrey's Dame Edna. She's kind of slightly, not quite as uh, biting as she becomes later on, I think. So in a time of crisis, there's nothing quite so nice as singing. In those days, comedy was largely men only. In the first show, the only prominent comedian was Elena Bron. She was in a sketch that was very unpolitically correct. Thank goodness. There's something I've got to tell you. <laughs> Yes, dear. There can be no possible doubt about it any longer. I'm going to have a baby. <laughs> For goodness sake, Penelope, how many times do I have to tell you it's not a baby, it's a balloon? <laughs> Charles, it is a baby. It's a balloon, Penelope. <laughs> It's a baby, darling. It's a balloon, Penelope. It's a baby. It's a balloon. Oh. Prick. If you talk to some of the women who were contemporaries of John Cleese and uh, Graham Chapman and um, Tim Turner and so on at, at Cambridge, they don't have very kind things to say about their memories there because women were treated as oh, we need a woman in this sketch to, to feed some lines. You know, there's no question. The men got all the good jokes. When I was in the Footlights Club at Cambridge, there were a lot of people who are now famous comedians who were against the admission of women to the club. Um, and of course, Monty Python, which is in patches, a really great show, uh, is the most misogynistic show ever. It's got six guys who play women half the time, hideous old crones. And apart from that, the only actual women in the show were a couple of bimbos, really. But one woman made a major contribution. Connie Booth was then married to John Cleese. She co-scripted and co-starred in Faulty Towers with him. The hit of the second show was their sketch set in a bookshop. I wonder if you might have the amazing adventures of Captain Gladys Stoke pamphlet and her intrepid spaniel stig among the giant pygmies of Beckles. <laughs> Volume 8. Oh, we don't have it. Funny, we've got a lot of books here. Well, I mustn't keep you standing no, around. No, 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 we haven't. No, but I do. No, no, we haven't. We're closing for lunch. No, but no, I'm sorry. But I, I saw it over there. I saw it over there. What? Uh, Olsen's Standard Book of British Birds. Olsen's Standard Book of British Birds? Yes. Yes, well, we do have that, as a matter of fact. The expurgated version. <laughs> the expurgated version of Olsen's standard book of British birds? The one without the gannet. <laughs> the one without the gannet? They've all got the gannet. It's a standard British bird, the gannet. It's in all the books. Well, I don't like them. They wet their nests. Right? <laughs> Right, there you are. 
No garrets, no robins, no nutter. No shepherd. I can't buy that, it's torn. <laughs> Another first for amnesty was the use of celebrities in the sketches. It was a coup to get Britain's first female newsreader. I was asked if I'd do something for the show in 1979, and I said yes, without knowing what it was I was going to be asked to do. Good evening, mystery celebrity, and welcome. <laughs> and then they said, well, we've decided that we're going to run this competition where a member of the public has to guess which celebrity is beating them up. And Terry Jones was the poor victim. Are you ready? Yes! So, uh, Terry Jones and I had a bit of a practice behind the scenes. I was given a hefty pair of boxing gloves. We were sort of practiced rolling over and fainting and hitting and him going, oh, 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 get off, get off, it's Angela Rippon, it's Angela Rippon, Sandy Gall. But it was just fantastic fun. It must be Robin Day! Not Robin Day, but you're warmer. Oh, I'm warmer with Robin Day. It's a well-known television celebrity. Well-known television celebrity. Sandy Gall! Not Sandy Gall, but very hot, very oh. close. I'll give, you a, I'll give you a hint. Yes. He's female! Oh, Richard Baker! No, Richard Baker! She really was beating me up. She kept putting the boot in. Was, you know, she wasn't just playing. She actually really punched me. Not Tony Benn! I don't! I don't! She kicked me in the back and I'm trying to remember my lines. I wanted to get through to the end of it quickly because she was really hurting me. He must exaggerate. I didn't touch him. Honestly, what a fly. Close! Austin Morris! Anna Morris! It was unusual for people to see celebrities step out of their roles. So seeing a newsreader doing something different was not common. So maybe that made it funnier. Would you like to come back next week? <laughs> oh, yes, please, Brian. During one of the shows, we did the opening night, and we got a decent review somewhere, Guardian Independent. There were the only papers who took any notice of us at all. Um, but they said, you know, where, what happened to the biting satire? And the Jeremy Thorpe trial was on, I think, or had just finished. And Peter went right home that afternoon and wrote a piece. In 1979, the Liberal leader, Jeremy Thorpe, made headlines in a libel suit involving a man called Norman Scott. Scott's case was that Thorpe had hired a hitman to murder him, but Scott's dog was shot instead. Millions followed every revelation. When it came to court, Norman Scott announced to an astonished judge in an astonished press gallery uh, that he had been the lover of Jeremy Thorpe, the uh, splendid, dashing old Etonian leader of the Liberal Party, who was um, married to the ex-wife of the Earl of Harwood, the Queen's cousin, and was as um, fabulously establishment as you can get, and there had been no hint that had reached the public's ears that Jeremy Thorpe might not be as other girls. Uh, and this rather hysterical figure, Norman Scott, claimed that it was a plot to have him killed because he might tell the world that he was Jeremy Thorpe's lover. And it all went to trial. Um, um, Jeremy Thorpe sued and, uh, and so on. The trial ended with the judge advising the jury to return a verdict of not guilty and thereby clearing Thorpe's name. The judge had come out with this outrageously biased um, direction to the jury about how they ought to vote. And Peter had written this, uh, this, this sketch um, and performed it that night. And it was really like kind of live theatre, live comment on something political that was actually happening uh, that day. In the last few weeks, we all heard some pretty extraordinary allegations being made about one of the prettiest, about one of the most distinguished politicians <laughs> ever to rise to high office in this country, or not. Over the evidence of the so-called hitman, Mr. Olivia Newton-John, <laughs> I prefer to draw a discreet veil. He is, as we know, a man with a criminal past, but no criminal future. Oh, oh. He's a piece of ordure. 
a piece of excrement, <laughs> unable to carry out a simple murder plot. <laughs> without cocking the whole thing <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you are now to retire. Yes, indeed, should I. <laughs> <laughs> you are now to retire carefully to consider your verdict of not guilty. <laughs> And of course, uh, looking back at that uh, uh, piece, the ridicule that Peter was heaping on this judge's biased summing up in, in favor of a politician, it still seems relevant in the wake of the Hutton report. The sketch became such a hit, it was immediately published in Private Eye and even released as a single. It's just fantastic how judges still have this extraordinary propensity to believe someone because they have an old Italian tie, because they're a peer of the realm, or because they are the power, the establishment. And, um, uh, of course, apart from anything else, it uh, introduced to the world fantastic um, epithets and uh, euphemisms for, for uh, acts of gay love. I remember Peter said to us just before he went on, I just want one more euphemism for uh, homosexual. I got them all, any new ones, and we all sort of tried them all. And then Billy Connolly came up and said, well, in, in, in Glasgow, there's a, there is a phrase called the, uh, the player of the pink oboe. And, boom, it was time for the sketch to go. Peter goes on, and halfway through it... We have been forced to listen to the testimony of Mr. Norma St. John Scott. <laughs> the scoundrel, the parasite, Pervert, a worm, a self-confessed player of the pink obo. <laughs> and Peter, in the time he got from, from the wings to the sketch, had thrown in self-confessed, <laughs> which I thought really made player of the pink obo work. <laughs> Into this dazzling lineup came newcomer Rowan Atkinson. I know I needed, as soon as I walked on, was just to look and take control of the audience. Ainsley. <laughs> and just say, you know, you may not know what I'm, I'm about, but what I'm going to try and do is I'm just going to assume this role of this sardonic, sarcastic and sadistic schoolmaster and I'm going to try and stick to that characterization until the end of the sketch. Ellsworth Beast Major. <laughs> Ellsworth Beast <Yeah>! Minor. <laughs> I have a detention book. <laughs> Hemoglobin. If the audience knows you and knows that you're funny, they'll laugh almost at whatever you do. If you are John Cleese, you can come on and you just go, right, like that, and the audience starts laughing because it's John Cleese and all their expectations are there. But if they've never seen you before, it's so much harder. Nancy boy Potter. <laughs> no one really knew who I was or what I did. They were sort of educated. <laughs> in those three, four spots throughout the evening. And the schoolmaster, I think, was the first thing uh, uh, that I did, which kind of said, well, here I am, and this is the kind of thing I do. If I see it once more, this period plectrum, I shall have to tweak you. <laughs> do you have a solicitor, plectrum? <laughs> You're lying, Plectrum, so I shall tweak you anyway. <laughs> See me afterwards to be tweaked. Yes, isn't life tragic? <laughs> I'm not sure you could, you know, so successfully write or perform a sketch like that now. I think maybe since, you know, corporal punishment was stopped in schools, those sort of characters <laughs> sort of slipped out of favour in comedy terms. <laughs> because, because yet again, you know, the, you know, the character 
landscape has changed so much. You know, headmasters are very different now. They're far less sadistic. Don't snigger, Babcock. It's not that funny. Antony and Cleopatra is not a funny play. If Shakespeare had meant it to be funny, he would have put a joke in it. <laughs> The absence of Eric Idle created a gap in the Monty Python lineup. Rowan took his part in the Four Yorkshiremen sketch. We used to drink out of a rolled up newspaper. <laughs> Best we could manage was to suck on a piece of damp cloth. <laughs> For me, I was living a fantasy of actually being on stage with, with the Monty Python team doing a Monty Python sketch. Generally speaking, I felt as though I kept my end up as best I could. But it was a great uh, privilege. Mm. We had nothing. We used to live in a tiny old tumble-down house with great holes in the roof. A house? <laughs> you were lucky to have a house. We used to live in one room, 26 of us, no furniture, and half the floor was missing. A poor Yorkshire accent, I'm afraid. Like all my accents, are not at all good. Not at all good. Accents are not my thing. We used to have to get out the lake at 3 a.m., clean the lake, <laughs> eat a handful of hot gravel, work 20 hours a day at mill for twopence a month, come home, and Dad would beat us about the head and neck with a broken bottle if we were looking. <laughs> right. <clears throat> I used to get up in the morning at half past ten at night, half an hour before I went to bed. <laughs> Eat a lump of freezing cold poison, work 28 hours a day at mill, and pay mill order to let us work there. And when I got home, our dad used to murder us in cold blood each night and dance about on our graves, singing hallelujah. <laughs> now you try and tell the young people of today that, and they won't believe you. No. Nope. Nope. By the end of the evening, Rowan Atkinson had stolen the show. In the end of the world sketch, he discovered something that would make him into an international star. <laughs> and will there be a mighty wind? Certainly there will be a mighty wind. <laughs> will this wind be so mighty as to lay low the mountains of the earth? <laughs> really, all I was trying to to do with a slightly of craggy voice was to do a, a Dudley Moore impersonation. What's odd for me when I look at it now is because it is the forerunner of the voice that I eventually honed in on for Mr. Bean. As to lay low. As to lay low. The mountains. The mountains. Of the earth. It, it felt funny at the time, and so I thought when we were trying to think 10 years later, it must have been for a voice for Mr. Bean. That was just the voice that I'd done that had amused me the most. And so we used it. Yeah. Prepare for the end of the world. 30 seconds. Have you brought the picnic basket? <laughs> My defining comic hero at the time was John Cleese. You know, I was 23, whatever I was at the time, and, uh, and John was the man. Good evening, Michelangelo. I want to have a word with you about this last supper of yours. <laughs> oh, yes? I'm not happy with it. Oh, I know. You don't like the kangaroo. <laughs> what kangaroo? Well, I'll paint it out. No problem. I never saw a kangaroo. Well, it's right at the back, but uh, I'll alter it. No sweat. I'll make it into a disciple. <laughs> That's the problem. Right. The disciples. Are they too Jewish? I made Judas the most Jewish. No, no, it's just that there are 28 of them. <laughs> Not all the sketches were old favourites. Cleese wrote The Last Supper originally for the BBC, who rejected it as blasphemous. I don't mind, I was never... John phoned up and said he'd got this sketch, which he'd written for Python, but the BBC had banned. I don't really know who it would have offended, but things were different then. We were both very busy uh, with other work that week and we never got together to rehearse it. So we memorized it separately and then rehearsed it over the phone. 
We only ever did it at the show itself, which was very scary. Oh, look, the Last Supper is a significant event in the life of our Lord. The penultimate supper was not, even if they had a conjurer and a steel band. <laughs> I commissioned a Last Supper from you, and a Last Supper I want. Yeah, but look... With twelve disciples and one Christ. <laughs> one? <laughs> the Amnesty audiences were just terrific. There was a wonderful responsiveness. And of course, it was such a friendly audience that when you went on, you were very loose and being funny in comedy is all about that relaxation. It's just like sport, you know, if you go on feeling tight, it never quite happens. You can get away with it, but it's never really good. But they were just great, and they were there, and they knew the score, and they were wonderful to perform to. Oh, now, will you please tell me why in God's name you have painted this with three Christs in it? <laughs> is the two skinny ones. There was only one Savior. Well, I know that. I mean, everyone knows that. But what about a bit of artistic license? One Redeemer. I'll tell you what you want, mate. You want a bloody photographer, not a creative artist with some imagination. I'll tell you what I want. I want a Last Supper with one Christ, 12 disciples, no kangaroos by Thursday lunch, or you don't get paid. You bloody fascist. Look. <laughs> He has an extraordinary presence, which is not just charisma, it's also slightly frightening. And if you watch the close-ups of him as the lawyer, for example, in the courtroom sketch, it just shows you those extraordinary eyes and how he will always go just further than any other comedian would ever go. You do feel you're looking into the eyes of someone who is seriously mentally disturbed. I think that's part of the, the joy of it. I suggest that you murder these people. Yes, sir, I did. I put it to you that you murdered these people. Yes, sir, I did. I submit that you murdered these people. I didn't murder these people. Did you or did you not murder these people? Yes, I murdered yes these people. Yes or no? Yes, I murdered these people. Answer the question! Uh, I, I murdered these people. Please wheel this out of your nose, Mr. Mr. Bartlett, are you I realize you're meant to be the counsel for the defense. As well as the comics, a rich mix of musicians took part. Classical guitarist John Williams played Cavatina from the Vietnam War film The Deer Hunter. interested much in music for its own sake. I wanted something that was vaguely amusing, that there would be a, a point song with witty lyrics or something like that. Ladies and gentlemen, I've suffered for my music. Now it's your turn. I thought the best thing I could do under those circumstances was uh, the protest song, which some people said, oh, it's an attack on Bob Dylan and, and Donovan, bless him, said that you know, all my friends saying you're having a go at me. I'm not, I'm not. It's not, you know, it's just that at that time there were a lot of people doing kind of protest songs and all of them seemed to be, you know, making rather a lot of money doing it. So that was the angle I was coming from. All the prophets of doom can always find room in a world full of worry and fear. Tip cigarettes and chemistry sets and Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer <laughs> so I'm going back to my little old shack and drink me a bottle of wine that was meat on bouté before my birthday and have me a fucking good time 
there was a, still a sense, I suppose, a hangover from Watergate in the Vietnam War, and so on, that young people were naturally inclined to protest injustice wherever they found it, uh, in a way that now, in our very cynical, ironic, postmodern way, we find uh, rather kind of hysterical, perhaps, and rather inarticulate. Young people are now so soaked in financial worries and uh, career thoughts and ambitions that they seem to have very little time for international politics. When rain has hung the leaves with tears, I want you near for to kill my fears, to help me to leave all my blues behind. For standing in your heart is where I want to be and I long to be. Ah, but I may as well try and catch. I may as well try and catch. I felt we were the last generation of those people who went up to university who still kind of cared about being socially different and daring and. Uh, you know, wanting to change the world. Fighting in the streets With our children at our feet And the morals that they worship Will be gone And the men who spurred us on When rock star Pete Townsend played with John Williams, there was no time to set up equipment, so Pete played an acoustic version for the first time. demonstrators. And tomorrow is likely to be only the start of what could be a season of violence in Chile. But the security forces killed eight people and arrested 300. Amnesty says it's likely these people will have been tortured during questioning. We don't get food again. It is in particular the people in other countries who are mouthy, who get it in the neck. And you don't have to be a comic or a writer or a singer to do that. You can just be an ordinary person who talks too much. And that's essentially what comics and singers and writers do. They just talk too much. God bless us, we're allowed to do that. Um, and they're not. Singer-songwriters were you know, murdered just for being singer-songwriters in Chile. Victor Hara was a... Case in point, um, I, I sang in the stadium he was murdered in and uh, danced with mothers of people who'd also been murdered in that very, very spot. It was a very uh, symbolic and, and emotional um, thing for all of us. It really touches something when you realize that what you do, you do in freedom and you do in joy. You could be doing the same thing in another regime and be murdered for it. History can be blamed Cos the banners were all thrown in the last war Governments are really keen on locking people up that they don't like. It's as simple as that. And so I think one's got to have eyes and ears out all the time and voices that will shout out and say, this is wrong, this is terrible. We don't get fooled again In my travels, when I'd meet the leader or president of that country, the first thing I do is read them, the amnesty report on that country. Um, and uh, it really terrifies these brutes. After the Thatcher election in 1979, a new ethos swept the country. With the selfish culture of the 80s came a more ruthless breed of political comedy. Mrs Thatcher's hand, oh. She had a sore hand, oh. Four million unemployed, but oh. Yeah, because the tendons were constricting. That's true in her hand. The tendons were constricting and drawing in the fingers to form. A claw. You mustn't deal with 
with these people? Why not, Nancy, old honey bun? Because they're communists. Communists? Where? There! That's your hand. You mean your hand's a communist? You've been infiltrated? No, 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 no. Those people. Oh, come on, Nance. How do you know? Because they want to free dissidents. Uh, the amnesty shows change direction with more brash and often savage humour. This was even reflected in the new Oxbridge comics, Hugh Laurie and Stephen Fry. Jim, Jim. <laughs> Dear God. I want to go to bed with you. What was I doing? It was around that time, wasn't it, Jim, when you were in the middle of rather a messy divorce with what? the woman who was chiefly responsible for writing your scripts. Mm. And it was from then on that things started really to go wrong for you, isn't it? Blimey. Ooh. Did you find, Jim, that once you stop being mad, you stop being funny? <laughs> you know? And then, of course, then, of course, you let down Amnesty by refusing to do their annual charity show. <laughs> it was damn sporting. Damn sporting of Mr. Cleese to allow us to do that, wasn't it? Well, look, he's got nothing to say for himself. Without his dead parrot, he's nobody. It's, it's tragic. This is the wreck of a once noble comedian. Have had it up to here with sex, those nylon vests and hairy necks. They expect you to be flighty and they act like God Almighty because they've got a cock and they can mend a flex. And when they proudly strip and pose, I want to say, what's one of those? They tend to feel a failure if you don't love their genitalia. Though why you should, Christ only knows. One of the things that grew out of the Amnesty shows was the, as it were, seamless takeover of that generation by the, what were called uh, in the early 80s alternative comedians. Uh, one of the main features of the third show was Alexi Sale. I went around to some friend's flat the other night, right? I got up to the flat, talking about drugs, I got up to the flat, right? And I noticed a sickly sweet smell. <laughs> sickly sweet bloody smell. I thought, I, I thought, I, I, spam for tea. <laughs> and then I saw them, the extra long nine skin gall wires, dick compensators they was rolling. I said, Byron. I said, how do you manage to get the spam in there? And then I realised what was happening. I said, I'm hip to this groove, daddy oh, 23 skidoo, rock around the crocodile, man. So they all ignored me, you know. I sat down on the Habitat Pine scatter cushions. Because the one before had really made the career of Rowan Atkinson, I thought, well, it's going to do the same for me, irrespective of the fact that I was extraordinarily aggressive, you know, quite difficult to work with, uh, you know, not from Oxford or Cambridge. If you eat the fuckers. Uh, didn't quite work out like that, but, <laughs> but certainly... I saw it as a career opportunity. The lifestyle in Stoke Newington is terribly alternative, you know. But there's one thing about the scene I can't get behind, and that is all the people taking drugs and not giving me any of the bastards. The, the stuff I was doing, it's all about lifestyle and, you know, but that was all new then, you know. Nobody had done that stuff before about drugs and about the kind of clothes that they wore. And, you know, it was just revolutionary then. And the chunky jumper in the suit with a tailored pocket with a calculator. <laughs> All telling racy stories about commodity investment. <laughs> to see Lexi doing what's on in Stoke Newington, it was quite an anarchic thing to have in there because it was very unapologetically punk, Lexi's performance in that. And it was pretty sensational. I mean, it was legendary. So they had one toke of this dope, right? Just one toke. I was paralysed from the waist down. I lost the use of my fingers. And I developed every single symptom of typhoid. It was fucking amazing! And they're all going, oh, fucking amazing! Oh, fucking fantastic! Oh, save the shrimp, man! Yeah. The thing that, that was original about me, unlike the comics generally, they have a desperate need for approval, you know, and they want the audience to like them. And I genuinely 
genuinely didn't care if the audience liked me. In fact, I liked it if they didn't like me. I wanted them to laugh, but I would actually goad them, you know. I was often very, very aggressive. Modest man, it's like being inside a 50s radio, isn't it? <laughs> See them all peddling away, you know, look, look, it's naughty, the social worker. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly you had this very attitudinal stance that alternative performers could take. The idea of the privileged classes coming onto the stage and being funny in an intellectual way had been slowly subverted by other folks from the red brick universities and from the secondary moderns who also had something funny to say and who also believed that the abuse of human rights uh, was wrong. So suddenly, this thing started to become a broader church. I feel like Buster Loose with some bad jokes. I feel like Buster Loose with some bad jokes. Uh. I don't think anybody had ever gone to the trouble before of orchestrating, you know, four jokes like this. And I'm a funketeer, so it was a no-brainer to say, well, why don't you, why don't you have a, a like a Chuck, Chuck Brown and the Soul Searchers backing track? for these jokes. We had backing singers, we had funk musicians, we had all sorts, and it was a really good fun to do. A man was in a hospital bed. Oh, good God. The doctor said, I've got some good news uh, and some bad news. The man said, I watch the bad news. And the doc said, we've had to amputate both your legs. He said, ooh, good God. What's the good news? And the doc said, the man in the next bed wants to buy your slippers. And it sort of summed up the amnesty thing as well, which is this thing of combining music with jokes. And the audience really, I don't think they'd ever had funk in an amnesty show before. So it was, you know, I bought the funk to the barbed wire candle. It was great. A man walked into a barber shop. A man walked into a barber shop. He said, I want you to cut my hair. Just like Michael Jackson. See, that's how, that's how this dates. God almighty. Wouldn't want your hair like Michael Jackson now, would you? <laughs> when he woke up, he was completely bald. Just like this guy. He said, Baba! I think I'm one of the first black people to be on Amnesty. You know, there might have been a singer, but there, there definitely wasn't a comedian. So for the, you know, for the first time, there's a black guy on stage being funny rather than having people talk about him being in jail. <laughs> so it was quite, so it was quite good. We toured all the way around the deep south and there was a lot of segregation going around. We weren't allowed to play in the same room as white folks. Used to have to play in a little broom cupboard down the hall. They used to send the applause back in a little envelope. I get to perform black characters that come from the community and talk about, in a, in a joshing way, about things that, you know, things like oppression and slavery, and I get those jokes in and people go, <laughs> but they're a bit, you know, you know comedians get the, have the opportunity to do that. I think there is a relationship between comedy and human rights in the sense that comedians understand censorship. Comedians understand how wrong it is for people not to be allowed to express their mind. One of the things that is so essential in being a comedian is absolute freedom of speech, and I mean absolute. And therefore, I suppose comedians are amongst the first to be deeply distressed at the idea of those who are imprisoned or in some way stifled or indeed tortured uh, for speaking their mind, um, for thinking and communicating freely. So it's a kind of primal insult to the very energy that makes a comedian, I think. I think comedy has always been a way of escaping from your environment. I mean, the world presses in on you, and if you can get it into laugh, the, the bullies run away. And if you can, uh, you know, you can get other people to laugh, you sort of let out the, oh, I'm out, I'm free at last. So there's, I think there's something to do with that. You just knew that, oh, this is going to stop somebody being tortured? Yeah, I'll do that, you know. Somebody's going to get stoned? What? <laughs> oh, not stoned like that, like that. Jesus Christ, let's stop it now. You know, we'll help, you know. For one up-and-coming comedian, Amnesty launched her career. In a grim warning of the dawn of celebrity culture, Ruby Wax was given the job of interviewing the stars backstage. No, no, I can get you into show business, darling. You were the original presenter. Well, there I was. Luckily, I, I developed Ruby. other skills because I would have been so <laughs> off the air in ten minutes. Tonight Don't we're going to be. Amnesty. 
What's amnesty? They work for people behind bars. What are we doing, a show for bartenders? No, 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 it's a charity. They're working for nothing? Of course. Okay, we're gonna be meeting some of these suckers here tonight. Oh, look at this. <laughs> You know what, I like that high neck there, oh, in the big patty wads. It was grotesque, in a big fuchsia bowl. And then I wonder why I didn't get laid. <laughs> you loved it so much. I loved it so much. Put a quarter in, two quarters to hit that beat. Everybody started rocking. Remember feet, see my rock and roll. Anyway, Mark, rock roll, see my rock and roll. Can she talk? I look like a small Puerto Rican person, so I'm not sure if I was being afraid. <laughs> Mr. Cleese, Mr. Cleese, how much what? excitement did you feel knowing you were on the same stage as Liza Minnelli? Oh, fuck. <laughs> Funny guy. It's sad, isn't it? <laughs> and funny. you know what's sad is there's no other person I can play. Like, you know, you could always, you say, well, I was in character. That's me. Artist. Um, when did you first realize you were funny? Well, I think it was a sexual experience, you know what I'm saying? I think the first time I came to puberty, the first time I saw hair. First, what do you mean? Ruby, why is this phallic-shaped thing in my nose? Okay, look, Len, Len I'm trying to make you famous. Ruby, you know I mean? sod off. Why did comedians jump at the chance of doing it? It was because basically everybody's so egotistical. <laughs> it's good exposure. It's good exposure, yeah. But would you do it for another charity? I mean, why Amnesty? It's all about freedom of speech. I always it's said, like, those were the A-list. It was the, the that the, the Pythons gave it, actually, I think, initially. I think that's what it was. Yeah, I don't think we'd save a donkey. Sorry. Unless the career's slipping. I, I may actually save a donkey <laughs> in the next few years. <laughs> I always said you can see where your career is by what <laughs> charities you're asked to do. Like AIDS I is good, your number. Amnesty is good, but like save an aardvark. <laughs> Forget it. While younger comics were taking over from more established acts, the same change was happening in music, publicly with no apologies. Bored. Could you? <laughs> I mean, he's your friend. Sorry, you should tell him. <laughs> the later amnesty shows were becoming a showcase for rock stars. Just want to see you at night. Don't come round my house in the day. Love it when we start up the fight. Love it when the fight ends your way. I remember being really seriously nervous. So I was surprised that I didn't look as nervous as I know I felt. Because throughout my whole career, I've done very few acoustic things. I think it's because I write the songs and I do all the arrangements and I really like to hear all this stuff that I've put there. So I'm not that keen on playing um, the, the songs on my own. Um, so that's pretty unusual. I think it's nice when you can play something on your own just with the guitar and prove that the song stands up to that kind of scrutiny. The silicon chip inside her head gets switched to overload. Nobody's gonna go to school today She's gonna make them stay at home My voice was crap from singing all day in the studio and I wasn't directing it out and I just thought, no, this isn't very good. However, I never expected the bloody thing would crop up like 35 years later, whatever the fucking time it is, you know? Tell me why I don't like Mondays I wanna shoot You feel like you could do something a little bit different. Certainly it gave me confidence to, to know that I could actually go out there and just play the piano. Because being a drummer, it wasn't something that I felt totally natural at. I can feel it coming in the air and I've been waiting for this moment for all my life. Oh, Lord. 
That was the very first time I ever sat on stage on my own, playing the piano. I had to look at my hands. And if I did this to wipe this sweat away, which I, you know, this is my, my sweat spot. If I took my hand off, there's a good chance I may not know where to put it back down again. It was a big moment for me in becoming confident on stage playing a piano. There's little things which I remember as if they were yesterday about this, especially the music. One was Sting. He did. Message in a Bottle seemed an appropriate song about feeling isolated, and then not feeling isolated by other people contacting you. So it seemed a, a useful uh, metaphor for what amnesty actually do, make people feel less, less alone in the world. That someone gets my message in the bottle. I was happy to be up there on my own instead of having the whole band there, a whole big production. It's just easy. You're on and off. You do the song, people recognize it, they sing along, and you're out of there. In fact, if anything, it gave me the idea that uh, maybe I didn't need to be in a band anymore. I could maybe uh, make a living on my own. So I probably planted a seed for me creatively as well as uh, getting me interested in amnesty. Music moves you in a different way. It's a visceral thing. You know, with comedy, you're like this, or you're watching with you're watching visual jokes. Whereas music gets you right here. So it's a, you know, somebody singing a song about freedom is an amazing thing. It can really move you and make you make you passionate. Finale, veteran rock stars Jeff Beck and Eric Clapton joined the young Sting doing a Bob Dylan number. Sting kind of, whether he meant to or whether he was asked to, kind of led. <laughs> I think everybody else is either too shy or just sort of stood back and let him. Because he was he was he was a pushy little bloke, really. <laughs> Kind of bossy when it gets, a, you know, comes to music, and so I find myself you know, bossing Eric around and bossing Jeff Beck, these two icons. And I'm thinking, I can't believe I'm doing this. You know, I'm just, I'm telling, <laughs> I'm telling them what I think they should do. So many international rock stars appeared in Amnesty shows that the Secret Policeman's Balls became a huge hit in America. The shows helped to raise awareness of Amnesty's ongoing efforts to rescue prisoners of conscience. The seed was planted at, at Amnesty for Bob. You know, he, he saw what they were doing, he saw our entertainment could help that process, and then he took the ball and, and ran with it to further than anybody could possibly imagine. You know, I, I always felt I was on his coattails in that, that regard. These shows led to a new style of giant charity event, like Live Aid and Comet Relief. Because of television, they were now slickly produced and raised much more money. But people still remember those early amnesty benefits with great affection.
What I loved about it was the fact that it was rough around the edges. It was like a student review. Everybody had come together and there wasn't a proper running order and lots of people's names weren't on the list and you never quite knew what was happening. But it happened because of this incredible energy that everybody was putting into it. There was no idea of your image or what you looked like. Yeah, or, or your ratings. If you had the right shoes or the wrong socks in my case. Um, it, people just, it was more relaxed and more sort of easy going. I mean, you didn't really need a director. You wanted a, a snatch squad, really, to go on and get them off because they, everybody did twice as much as they said they were going to do. We're normally kind of cosseted and, you know, we're treated like royalty, you know. When there's too many royals backstage, you'll have to lump in. Terry, can I have your pads? Those dressing rooms were appallingly small. <laughs> Conditions were terrible. The food was non-existent. <laughs> Where was amnesty when you need them? <laughs> As the old poet says, you can't hope to recapture that first fine, careless rapture. And you watch the early, uh, early shows, and there is a, a fine, careless rapture about it. You felt that you were nailing your colours to the mast, as it were, when you did Amnesty International. When you do comic relief, you can be slightly more ambiguous, you know, I suppose, in your political intent. But with Amnesty, you're definitely saying, I am against this. This is wrong. And I think, I think that gives it some metal. presents this idealized potential that we could treat each other better. It is idealism, and I do believe it, it's possible. So it's a potential, and I think we need to support organizations that offer us that potential. Just like yesterday, then I'll get on my knees and I'll pray. We don't get fooled again. I had a strange thought the other day that I feel as though I'm probably the last, a member of the last generation to truly enjoy freedom of thought in the sense that you can't have a feeling that within 20 years someone will have invented a machine uh, to read your mind. You know, there's absolutely no reason why that should not be the case. The, the degree and the rate at which a technology adv advances, whereas I know that my thoughts are my own at, at the moment. But I cannot believe that many more decades will go by when that will be the case. A and I think that's a horrible thought. I got a frightening, frightening thought. I, I haven't a clue what Amnesty can do about it. <laughs> Absolutely nothing, I suspect, but it is. But it just puts you in mind of how fragile and important a thing uh, freedom is. And that sometimes, actually, you know, you have to take a stand against what is deemed to be progress in order to re-establish, you know, human dignity and human freedoms. I'm just one of those people who want to feel good all the time. I don't want no bad news messing with my mind. Well, who is and who isn't these days? It's hard to tell when so many people have so many good reasons to feel more than just a little annoyed. But what can you do when you're sure somebody is screwing around with your reality? I'm just one of those people who want to feel good all the time. I, 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 I'm just one of those people who want to feel good all the time.